Hello everyone, as promised, I am back with another lecture on the basics of Indian polity. Now, for those of you who are new to my lecture, welcome. My name is Shobhna Menon. Thank you so much for stopping by. I really appreciate it. Please go ahead and subscribe to my channel by pressing the subscribe button below. Now, in our previous lecture, we had come to understand how the British East India Company virtually began ruling India by establishing governors along with their respective presidencies primarily at Madras, Bombay and Calcutta. In this lecture, we shall understand how the British Parliament sitting in London was able to exert its authority over the operations of the East India Company. Now, the question that you must ask is, why was there a need to do so? Why did the Parliament in London, which had initially placed so much of faith, trust and had granted so much of autonomy to the East India Company suddenly start interfering with the company's affairs in India? Well, the answer to this question lies in the later half of the 18th century when the East India Company won the Battle of Buxar in 1764 and was subsequently granted the Diwani rights. Now, please note the Diwani rights made the company very rich and therefore a lot of the company's officials started amassing a large amount of wealth which were undisclosed from the company's books of accounts. The news of this practice reached the British Parliament in London and it infuriated and ruffled quite a lot of feathers and it was decided that it was high time that the company's governance and operations were to be controlled and regulated as per specific laws that were passed by the parliamentarians themselves. Now, to understand this issue a little better, let us go back to 1765 when the Diwani rights were granted to the East India Company by the Mughal Emperor Shah Alam II as per the Allahabad Treaty of 1765. What is a Diwani right? Basically, it is a privilege that was given to the East India Company granting them exclusive jurisdiction of revenue and civil justice over the lands of Bihar, Bengal and Orissa. Simply put, this meant that the East India Company had complete rights over the natural and monetary resources that were generated from these lands. Now, this could not have come at a better time for the East India Company. Why? Because in the earlier part of the 18th century, the company had to heavily rely on the import of money in the form of gold and silver from the British Treasury in London. This meant a large cash outflow and huge monetary stress on the British coffers. But after the granting of the Diwani rights, the East India Company was able to completely stop being dependent on these imports because now it was able to fund its entire operations in India as per the revenue that was generated from the Diwani. This ended up saving millions of pounds on an annual basis for the British Treasury in London. Now, not only this, the granting of the Diwani rights also ended up changing the face of Britain from a chief importing country into an export destination country. Please note that for an entrepreneur to be successful, he requires access to labor, raw material and capital. In India, the East India Company already had access to the cheapest labor. But after the granting of the Diwani rights, it now had access to free and quality raw material and capital in the form of revenue generated by the Diwani. This led to the fueling of the Industrial Revolution. The first Industrial Revolution of the world, which spanned a hundred years from the mid-1700s to the mid-1800s, which was responsible for the most important inventions of the 20th century, was funded with Indian money. Now, coming back to the point on why the parliament started interfering with the company's affairs, the first reason being, as I have already mentioned, the company's servants started amassing large amount of money illegally. 
For example, Robert Clive was actually sent from Britain to India as the governor of Bengal in 1764 primarily to clean up the corruption and maladministration that existed in the company. But by the time he left in 1767, ironically, it was known that he ended up amassing a fortune of over 400,000 pounds. The second reason was that back then, in those days, a very popular man by the name of Adam Smith, who is today regarded as the father of economics, had propounded a theory that a nation should be concerned if it sees a sudden and an unprecedented increase in an individual's wealth. In this case, the individual was the East India Company and the parliament did observe that the East India Company was more interested in distributing its wealth among a few of its officials rather than sending it back to London for the benefit of the nation, thus proving Adam Smith's theory accurate. The third reason actually came as a final nail in the coffin. The East India Company had approached the British Parliament in London requesting for a loan of over 1.4 million pounds. This opportunity was seized by the Parliament and the loan was granted to the company with one condition provided that the administration of the company was now to be run as per the directions of the Parliament. Thus came to form the Regulating Act of 1773. Notice how the parliament used the word regulating in order to make its intentions perfectly clear that it does intend to take over the operations of the company completely in the near future. Now the Regulating Act of 1773 had a few features that you must understand. The first feature was changes in the manner of elections. Now the management of the East India Company was called the Board of Directors. These directors were elected by a larger group of members called the Court of Proprietors. Now, if I had to be a member of the Court of Proprietors, I had to hold a minimum shareholding of £500 in the East India Company shares. After the passage of the Regulating Act of 1773, this minimum subscription of £500 was raised to £1,000. The rationale behind this was to remove all the unnecessary members who were making the elections of the board of directors a cumbersome process and only serious contenders who wished to implement efficiency in the management of the company remained. The second feature was the change in the frequency of the elections of the board of directors. Earlier, the board of directors were elected on an annual basis. Now, the problem with this was that by the time a new administration was set up, policies were framed and then implemented, the year would end and a new election would come up. Now, this hindered the continuity of the administration in the company. As a result, the parliament decided through the passage of the Regulating Act of 1773 that the elections were now to be conducted once every four years. The members of the board of directors were to be limited to 24 only and six directors would be retiring each year. The third most important feature of this act was the creation of the office of the Governor General of Bengal. The Governor of Bengal was now replaced and a new office was created called the Governor General of Bengal who was now superior to the governors of the presidencies of Bombay and Madras. The parliament provided the governor general four officials and this body came to be known as the governor general and his council members. Now, the first governor general of Bengal was Warren Hastings and decisions in this body were made as per the majority. So, the governor general did have a casting vote but ultimately the decisions would be as per the majority ruling. Now, the fourth most important feature of this act was the establishment of the Supreme Court at Calcutta. This Supreme Court had one Chief Justice and three other judges and this was deemed to be the highest court of British India. Now these were the four features of the Regulating Act of 1773. Now this was passed with full intentions of implementing efficiency in the administration of the company's affairs. 
but it came with its own set of drawbacks and shortcomings the first one being overlapping of the jurisdiction of the governor general's decision and the supreme court's chief justice's just judgment so the judgment of the supreme court was over civil criminal admiralty that is navy and religious issues that is matters concerning the church the jurisdiction of governor general was over military civil and revenue over the diwani provinces now the regulating act of 1773 did not specify whose authority will prevail in case of a clash of decisions and judgments between the governor general and the supreme court's chief justice this led to a lot of problems between the court and the council the second problem was that any regulation that was to be passed by the governor general's council had to be registered with the supreme court in order to become a law now this led to the supreme court's chief justice analyzing the regulation and pointing out flaws as a result it would not become a law the administration suffered and the governor general's council and the supreme court's justices would constantly be at loggerheads the third problem was that the act did not mention how the indians were to be treated as per the laws that were introduced as a result the supreme court at calcutta assumed that the new laws were to be app applicable to the indians as well and this ended up creating a lot of resentment among the indians and it led to an increase in animosity between the british and the natives now the fourth problem was that the governor general often ended up having problems with his own council members as mentioned earlier decisions were taken as per the majority ruling it often happened that the governor general did not agree with the majority ruling but he was still held accountable to the board of directors to the of the east india company of all the decisions that were taken in the majority ruling as a result there was a lot of friction between the governor general and his own council members and the fifth problem was that the governors of bombay and madras who were supposed to be subordinate to the governor general of bengal in reality acted independently of him they often used to give this excuse that decisions were urgent and they had no time to confirm it and check it with him and as a result this led to insubordination of these two governors in front of the governor general of bengal so these were the shortcomings that were faced by this act and this was later changed and rectified in the pits india act of 1784 which i shall discuss in the next video thank you so much for watching please like share subscribe comment if you've liked this video have a good day